Hello everyone and welcome to another recommends video. This time we're going to be doing Beyond the Blue Horizon, which is the name of the second novel in the He She series by Frederick Powell. The first novel is called Gateway and there'll be a link to a video of it in the upper right corner. Beyond the Blue Event Horizon was published in 1980. With that out of the way, let's get into it. When the story begins, we meet Juan. Juan is a 15-year-old boy who lives out in the reaches of space, travels between one space station that he lives on and another where he gets food and companionship. He's been alone since he was four years old when his parents disappeared. On the larger space station where he gets his food, there are people he called the old ones that are humanoids that are pretty easy for him to avoid because they move slow and they're relatively easy to outwit. Also on that space station are some computerized personalities of dead humans. They are the ones that he speaks to. Some of them are lucid enough for him to hold a conversation with. They are the ones who have been educating him and giving him physical exams when needed. He calls them the dead men. Also on that station is something he calls the dreaming room where he goes sometimes when he's feeling especially lonely and he can be in civilization but he never stays there too long and that has been his routine for the past 11 years. We now shift to a small spaceship that is traveling to the Oort Cloud. It holds a family of four. Paul C. Hall, his wife Dorima, who is called Lurvy, her 14-year-old half-sister Janine, and their father Peter. They head now to the Oort Cloud to locate and bring back a Hitchi food factory. If it's a working food factory, then it would alleviate the food problem for the 12 billion people on earth. It was discovered by a prospector who didn't realize what she had discovered and died on her way back to earth, but her report made it. After traveling for three and a half years, they finally arrived at the food factory and docked and got into it, walked around a bit, and then got down to work strapping on iron rockets on it to bring it back towards Earth, but they ran into a problem. The food factory was not in free orbit. It had thrust. It had very little, less than 1% of a G, but it was there. And that means that strapping the rockets onto the side of it was going to be enormously difficult since the rockets would now weigh hundreds of kilograms. They finally found a way to strap the rockets onto the food factory but they ran into another problem. When they started their rockets, it seems that the food factory adjusted its thrust to stay where it is. So they sent a message to Earth asking what they should do. And while they were waiting for a reply, Janine decided to explore the food factory on her own. And of course, she ran into one. When Juan saw Janine, he immediately began to masturbate because of the things that some of the dead men told him. Janine immediately called for her family who came running and began to question him. During the questioning, he reached out and spoke to one of the dead men. He explained to Paul and the rest that this was one of two stations. The main station was a 45 day trip away. So Petar immediately realized that the only way he could be speaking to one of the dead men who is located in the other station is via FTL communications. One who by this time was feeling ill and tired dropped into the couch and began to sleep. We shift down to Earth where Rabbit Broadhead and his wife Essie have just gotten a report on what's going on at the Hitchi Food Factory. His company, Rabbit Broadhead Inc., has a subsidiary that is in partnership with the Gateway Corporation and has financed four trips to nearby Hitchi artifacts and the food factory is one of them. Robin, speaking with his AI Albert Einstein, figured out that the dead men are prospectors. They just don't know how their minds were recorded, that one's mother was probably a prospector, and that the food factory is operational. Ships seem to be coming and going from it. That's when the fever hit. The fever is called the 130 day fever and it affects the entire population of earth. It causes intense emotions, depression, euphoria, it also causes mass hallucinations. During its episodes, many people die from it. 
and it started unexpectedly 10 years before and it happens roughly every 130 days. Back in the food factory, Janine was paying very close attention to Juan and she noticed when he was getting sick, he apparently caught the flu from the family. He hopped into the couch in the dream chamber to sleep and the minute it enclosed him was when the 130 day fever hit. She managed to drag him out of the couch and the minute she did, the hallucination stopped instantly and the physical effects of it slowly wore off. They managed to drag a very sick one back to their ship. It took 12 hours before his fever receded and he was sleeping normally. Janine was the one who took care of Juan, not letting anyone else touch him. By then they realized that whenever Juan goes into the dreaming room and goes into the couch, he broadcasts his dreams to everyone throughout the solar system and that is what causes the 130 day fever. They explained it to Juan and told him he shouldn't use the couch anymore and the repercussions of what happens when he does. But Janine of course wanted to try it and so Juan let her try it and her family of course found out after she came out and they were very angry with her and began arguing with each other. So they decided they should go with Juan to see the other station but one person would have to stay behind for communications and they decided that Peter was going to be the one who stayed behind. Back on earth, this was the worst 130 day fever ever and the death toll was the highest. And Robin's wife, Essie, was seriously hurt in this one. For a while it looked like she had died but they managed to resuscitate her. In the meanwhile, Robin's scientific AI, Albert, had figured out that the 130 day fever was coming from the food factory. Also, the husband of the woman who originally found it, although she didn't know what it was and she seems to have long since died, he is suing both Robin and the Gateway Corporation and anyone else involved in it so that he can get his share of the profits from that factory. So he got an injunction placed against anyone who is doing any work on the factory until the case plays out in court. And the Gateway Corporation, now that it knows that the 130 day fever is coming from the food factory wants to slow down until they understand it better. And just as he was visiting his wife who was convalescing, another fever hit. But this time it was incredibly short. It seems as if someone is experimenting with the couch. So he sent an order to the whole family that's on the food factory telling them to stop any use of the couch for any purpose. Dismantle it if they can without damaging anything but if they go ahead and do this again they will forfeit all pay and bonuses. So they made it to the new space station, the one they call Hitchi Heaven and it was massive at least a kilometer long. One began showing them around. He took them to the different areas blue, green, red and gold. He warned them that they should never go into the gold area because that's where the old ones lived and his father had told him he must never get caught by them. He took them to where the personalized computer entities were stored and using their portable computers they were able to ascertain that these were indeed personalities that were recorded from gateway prospectors that had not returned from their missions. They also found out who Juan's mother was. They placed a camera in the gold sector so they could get a video of the old ones but when the old ones saw it they destroyed it. At this time one showed them that the Hitchi prayer fans were actually data storage devices that could be read with special readers that are all over both stations. But those were all stored in the gold sector so they decided they were going to go and get a whole bunch more of them and bring them back and at the same time they would put more cameras but as they went they got caught. The only one to get away was Paul. Meanwhile back on the ship that was attached to the food factory, Peter was alone. He received a message from his family showing that the prayer fans were actually records. At first he was happy because since there were thousands of these prayer fans all over, this meant a huge bonus. But then he got a frantic message from Paul saying that Lurvy, Janine and Juan were captured and he thought he would be next. 
But then he began to get angry because Peter was a very old man. He was older than even his family realized. So he decided he was going to give Earth an ultimatum. If they responded favorably, then he would give them the information he had. But if they didn't, then he would punish them. Back on Earth, Robin is fighting to keep control of the expedition to the food factory and Hitchy Heaven. His wife suffers a serious relapse. When he finally came to an agreement with the man that's suing them, that's when everyone on Earth receives Peter's ultimatum. Back on Hitchy Heaven, the central computer, which is known as the oldest one, was awakened by the old ones. They awakened it to tell it that they had captured some intruders. At first it wasn't concerned, but after some examination, it, it scanned the dead men and it realized that they had been in contact with the civilization that sent them. And so they had turned their attention to his facility and maybe jeopardizing his plans. So it powered up its engines and headed for the one place where it can get some advice on what to do. Back on Earth, Essie had several more operations before she began to get well. Meanwhile, she and Robin, along with his science advisor AI and his psychoanalyst AI, put together a plan to go and rescue the tree people that were being held captive on Hitchy Heaven and also to stop Peter. So he made his way to the moon and outfitted a five and was stopped by the Gateway Corporation from boarding it. That's when Peter launched his final and most devastating attack. He was in the couch and he was dying and he let everyone in the solar system feel his anger, his rage, his despair, and his madness as he lay dying. While this was going on, Robin had enough self-awareness to hop into the five and take off while everybody else was incapacitated. But Robin had made a mistake. He had calculated where the Hishi heaven was. It was supposed to be 22 days away, so he had taken enough food for 22 days. But he didn't know that it had moved, and the halfway point didn't come until day 19. So he had 19 more days to go, and not enough food or air. Back on Hichi Heaven, the oldest one was trying to breed two of the captives, Luvi and Juan, and he was forcing Janine into a dream couch to relive the lives of the old ones, going back in time to a point before they even had intelligence. But at the end, Lovey, Robin, and Paul came and rescued her and Juan. So before Robin and Paul got around to rescuing the rest of them, they took some equipment from Robin's ship, where he had survived almost 30 days without food. That equipment allowed them to trick one of the dead men, Henrietta, into thinking her husband was around and got her to spill the information on how to control the Hitchy Heaven. They waited until the oldest one was in his robotic shell and trapped him in the corridor and destroyed him. When they gained control of the Hitchy Heaven, they got all the information on it a way of how to control the Hishi ships, how to build them, and what made them go faster than light. Apparently, all you had to do was decrease the mass to zero when increasing the speed. So Robin Broadhead became the richest man in the solar system, and the halls also became very rich. They parked the Hishi heaven in Earth orbit. Albert, speaking with Robin, speculates that the Hishi is trying to get the universe to collapse, which explains the universe's missing mass and that they are hiding in a black hole in the center of the galaxy until the job is done. In the final chapter, we find out that the Hitchi really did go into a black hole to hide. They found evidence that out there in the universe somewhere, there was an intelligence that was re-engineering the universe to cause it to collapse and they believed they were doing this so that those creatures, whoever they are, could rebuild the universe in their own image. So the Hichi went into a black hole and pulled in with them 10,000 of the longest lived stars that they could find. They also tried to help accelerate the development of intelligence in some of the young species that they found in the hopes that those species would grow up and become 
high-tech civilizations that would act as a buffer between them and whoever the species is that is trying to collapse the universe. And that's how the book ends. I'd like to thank you for watching and listening. Subscribe if you haven't. Give us a thumbs up. Drop us a comment. And I will see you in the next video.